Surveying influential figures of American ceramics, it's clear that Randy Johnston has made a lasting impact. With a career spanning over 40 years as an educator and artist, he has helped shape the field both in the classroom and through the exhibition of his work. Randy has been a recipient of multiple prestigious awards and his work can be found in the collections of many national and international institutions. From his time studying under Warren McKenzie, his residency in Japan, and later pioneering the popularization of wood firing in the United States, his influences have manifested in a career that continues to evolve and inspire. With that, it's my pleasure to welcome Randy Johnson to Kona for this installment of Clay Conversations. Randy, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thanks, Jake. Uh, let's start out with a question about your studio practice and the balancing of time and energy in a shared space. And it seems to me that artists are often perceived as solitary geniuses, cloistered away in their studios, bending tool and material to their individual will. Now that you've spent decades sharing a studio space with Jan McKay Johnston, how do you see that this cohabitation has affected your work? Um, it's. I have to say, long term, it's been a, a very um, wonderful and uh, very profound kind of experience to be able to work and share a studio with um, somebody who you respect their work. And um, it, it, as anybody who has a relationship would know, it's not always easy day to day to navigate, you know, all the idiosyncrasies that happen within relationships. But um, in in our studio, Jan has. Uh, her end of the studio, I have my end of the studio. Um, there's a line in the middle. And the joke was on um, the first day when she saw the crack in the floor, I thought she was complaining about the, the crack in the concrete. And she said, no, you see this line? And I said, yeah, I see it. And um, I was gonna tell her there's concrete that's cracked and there's concrete that will crack. And she said, no, this line. And I said, I see it. And she said, don't cross it. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, have a policy in our studio that um, we both work on our own work. We don't collaborate other than uh, the glazing time and the loading of the kilns and the firing of the kilns. But the um, actual work that we do in the studio is each individual. And we uh, have an active policy that if we are um, you know, working for maybe a three and a half month period on, on a body of work for a fire, that we will have critiques. Mm -hmm. And, but we don't just go up and start talking about each other's work. It's usually, um, I have a piece I'm working on and uh, would you mind if you have time to come over and, and talk to me about this? And I think that's, um, you know, it's something that if somebody's working in a studio by themselves so that they don't, necessarily have that opportunity and, and you begin to miss it, you become um, maybe much more insular or um, you know, your, your thinking process isn't allowed to expand um, with the helpful vision of somebody else who's you know, obviously a, a very well-trained and very astute artist. Well, it seems like a great privilege to work in a space with someone, for one, who you love Mm -hmm. and have a deep respect for uh, them as an individual and the work and to have someone to be a sounding board for progress on, on both of your ends. You know? mm -hmm. so. um, I always know where to look if one of my tools is missing. That's one of the <laughs> funny things in the studio. Um, you know, working, also anybody who's done work in ceramics knows uh, what a labor intensive process it is. And um, it's, it's very helpful either maybe to have an apprentice or an assistant or someone, again, whom you can work with in a studio situation to share those responsibilities of mixing clay, mixing glazes, um, loading, unloading bisques, sweeping the floor. I mean, all these, all these things are part of um, the everyday nuts and bolts of running a ceramic studio. Definitely, and, yeah. I imagine unloading pallets of clay is better with four hands than... It's better with a forklift. A forklift. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Um, Randy, in the pursuit of your craft, you studied under the late Shimaoka Tatsuzo in Mashiko, Japan, in a studio steeped in the tradition of that specific place and culture. Uh, that experience must have had a lasting impact on your work, and I'm curious on how you navigate incorporating ceramic ideas that were developed outside of your own culture into your own studio practice. 
That's a, it's a very interesting question, um, Jake. And, you know, there's, I think there are kind of layered answers to that. Um, my first contact with Clay was through Warren McKenzie at the University of Minnesota. And Warren worked with uh, Bernard Leach. And while he was an apprentice at Bernard Leach's studio, uh, he had numerous occasions to meet Shoji Hamada. And so Warren brought to the table, as you imagine an intro uh, student in Clay, he brought uh, to the table for us um, ideas about Bernard Leach and um, Hamada, especially. Um, Bernard was still alive at the time, so Warren was um, doing, but Bernard was blind. And Warren was, would, would bring in um, audio tapes that he was exchanging with Bernard Leach. So we got to hear Bernard's voice, you know, pontificating about pots. He never liked Warren's pots. It was really interesting. He was always um, denigrating of Warren's pots. But Warren sucked it up and, you know, would move forward. Uh, Warren would also take us to what at that time was the, uh, the University Museum. And um, he, we would hold Hamada pots. We would hold Hans Kopers. We would hold Bernard Leach pots. And as a young student, um, we coveted, you know, looking at the feet, looking at the rims, looking at the volumes. And, um, you know, that, that experience of actually holding, touching those pieces, I think, had a profound impact for me. And so when I, I went to Mashiko and immersed myself in the context of uh, Japanese ceramics with Shimoka, um, I remember the first day I was there, Shimoka said, what, what would you like to do while you were here? Do you want to be, you know, I was, a, I was his guest. I wasn't an apprentice like Ken Masazaki. Mm -hmm. But um, I said, well, and I was 25 years old. I'd been making pots at that time for um, eight years. And I said, I'd, I'd like to learn about Japanese techniques and learn how to um, you know, uh, learn about wood firing. So that's what I did. I worked on a, a keirokoro, a kick wheel, a wood kick wheel, and um, I made uh, yonomis for uh, shimoka. I made uh, teapots, and I made uh, small guinomi, the little sake cups. And you know, the the learning there was that they would put a a a piece of bisquare of that form in front of you and you had something called a tombo which was like a children's toy it's mm -hmm. a little propeller that you spin that would measure the width and the depth of the pot that you were throwing and those are the only measurements you had other than your eye and I really feel um, that I s could step right into the making process there because um, and I've thought a lot about this I think that the line in the pots that Warren understood from Bernard Leach and from uh, Hamada was the line of Shimoka's pots. So it wasn't like I was having to learn a whole new vocabulary or a whole new system of making. Um, and, um, you know, unless they, my pots were going out the back door into the scrap pile, I think they, you know, they glazed and fired them and, you know, put them through the, the process rather quickly. Um, I was 25 years old, and, you know, full of myself, kind of cocky probably, and um, when um, there was one maker at Shimoka's, back up a little bit here, but each potter at Shimoka's was trained to make one item, maybe two. So you had a plate maker or a large bowl maker or um, the man named Oji-san or oji Young. Uh, worked on a hand wheel like Hamada and he made the teapots and he could make all the pots. But um, all the other workers just were trained to make one pot. And it was very interesting that um, they had a very difficult time if they were allowed to make something else. They weren't trained to make it. Very specialized. Very specialized. Well, it seems like you put in a lot of um, your heart and soul and sweat and uh, energy into learning uh, Japanese ceramics, going to those studios and mm -hmm. uh, engaging with um, the masters in those traditions. Um, uh, what would advice would you give to 
people coming up in ceramics, if they're interested in, say, a, a tradition that's not of their own and incorporating that into their work? Well, the advice I give to any artist doing anything is, you know, develop a, a visual and experiential vocabulary mm -hmm. within whatever medium or ideas that you're working. And, um, you know, the you can't deny our, our history in ceramics, nor should you, I think. But I think it's also important for people to be aware of, are you copying a piece? Mm -hmm. You know, or are you looking and studying a piece? And I think it's a a good um, opportunity as a teacher sometimes to assign. I would assign students to go pick a historical piece and make that. And by making it, you delve into the understanding and maybe the context, the history of it, um, maybe a little bit of the you know religious social dynamic that um, existed in that culture that generated that piece. Was it? purely functional, did it have um, religious and spiritual connotations, did it, you know, what, what was its function within that world, and uh, to assimilate that, mm -hmm. and, but always be aware of, gee, am I, am I just copying that, or am I assimilating the ideas and um, pushing it forward? Well, it seems like coming at that process of that visual investigation and the material investigation in the studio are almost following the, the footsteps or fingerprints of those artists and understand that form or mm -hmm. process um, through the actual haptic mm -hmm. experience too. Yeah, yeah it's, um, I always think of, you know, working in any material, again, in media is, is like learning a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn progressions, you learn technique. You learn technique so you can forget technique <laughs> in the end. Um, and that's a hard concept to understand when you're first, um, you know, working in any art form. Mm -hmm. But after, you know, after you've been working in ceramics or drawing or what for 50 years, I don't, I don't think so much about, gee, how do I, how am I going to touch the clay? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I enjoy the mark making, the gestures, the, you know, whatever's happening in the immediacy of that. I'm not necessarily thinking, um, you know, how do I slip and score this and attach it so it doesn't fall apart. And I think that, um, I don't know when that happens, but I think that at some point in, in your making and in your, lear in your learning, you will evolve to the point where you're not having to consciously think about how to do this. You just, you just do it. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, part of your so, nature. Yeah, it becomes an intimate part of the making. Sure. And, you know, I, I can almost say I've worked almost every day of my life. Mm. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, times for breaks and things like that. But um, since I was 18 years old. And so, you know, slow learner, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time to practice. Yeah. Well, speaking of technique and uh, practice and time, uh, I'd like to talk about your passion for wood firing. And, you know, for those listening who don't know that wood firing is one of the oldest way of heating clay into ceramic high fire technique. Um, could you describe your love affair with this ancient laborious and exhilarating process? Um, it started you know a long time ago and um, when I was in school we there as far as I knew there were no active wood kilns in America. Now, there were probably groundhog kilns in the southeast, but context again, we didn't have internet. <laughs> um, there were two or three active books in ceramics, Daniel Rhodes. Mm. Um, there was a book by um, F. Carlton Ball, I think, uh, but very few books. There was the Bernard Leach book, mm -hmm. which was our Bible. Yeah, right, right. Okay, and. So, you know, the idea of wood firing for us um, at that time was we had gas kilns and we had some accessibility to pallets, break them up and, you know, throw the pallets in the, one of the peepholes and we get fire and flame. And, but the reality of, of putting one pallet in a, in a kiln, it was more 
a pyrotechnical event <laughs> than it was depositing wood ash mm -hmm. on the surface. And uh, Daniel Rhodes at that time, to his credit, but he had photographed a kiln, uh, a Japanese climbing kiln mm -hmm. in the back of his kiln book. And, um, you know, at age 19, 20, I was looking at those pictures and thinking, I'm, I'm gonna build one of these. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated, I you know, bought some land and I salvaged some bricks from the clinker foundry in Chicago and I started off to build that kiln and I did. But that kiln was fraught with difficulty. Um, it was very, I didn't know what I was doing, number one, but also um, it just didn't fire very well at all. And um, I was corresponding with Michael Cardu at the time asking for advice. Warren had had fired some kilns in Le Bourne, France, some big monster mm -hmm. kilns. So he would come out and kind of try to help us get the kiln to temperature. Talked about, you know, breaking up the furniture in the house in, in France sometimes to, to get temperature. I wouldn't have had enough furniture sure. to even get to O10 in my kiln. But um, anyway, long story short, in 1975, I got the chance through a friend in Minneapolis to uh, go to a dinner with Shimoka uh, Tatsuzo. And um, I asked Heiko, I, I called her right back after I hung up the phone. and I said, can I bring some pots of mine, just show them and ask him if I can come and do an apprenticeship. And when I got to her door um, with my little box of treasures that I thought he might like well enough that he would accept me she gave me a big hug and she said, it's all arranged, you can go. Mm. So um, that was, then I went to work at Shimoka's and that was my first contact with um, firing wood kilns that worked, you know, working with the workers and um, seeing the timing of the wood stokes, um, what they were looking for, the quality and density of the flame, um, you know, letting the flame burn so you extracted heat. We didn't have pyrometers at the time, so it was all visual. And when I came back from Japan, I immediately tore down my old kiln and rebuilt a kiln based on Shimoka's kiln and the kiln builders that I had spent one week with in Mashiko. And um, that kiln, our kiln, uh, works beautifully. It's the same yeah. kiln from that time. It's it's been rebuilt once, but same kiln, wow. same design. And when we rebuilt it, um, I was very careful. I think we rebuilt it after about 27 years. And I was very careful to um, measure all the openings, all the great system, the arch forms, um, everything, because I didn't want to lose. I was fearful that I might lose some of the ideas that I had learned in Mashiko 25 years ago. But the, the new kiln is, um, Jay and I say it's like uh, driving a sports car down a, uh, a road with the top down on a sunny day with a glass of wine. Oh, it's that just, sounds uh, nice. <laughs> hmm. Well, from my experience speaking with full-time studio artists, uh, I know there can be external pressures to keep within a certain stylistic range of work. Um, and as a currently a full-time studio artist and as an educator, uh, how do you keep the creative energy dynamic and evolving while maintaining relationships with galleries who may expect a certain style from your work? Or do you find that problem at all? Um, I don't, I try to make um, the the best pieces that I can make mm -hmm. at any given time. I'm, I'm less worried about trying to satisfy what a gallery mm -hmm. maybe wants or needs. Um, that might sound arrogant, but um, I'm not, I think galleries that represent me expect me as an artist to be buoyed, you know, the ideas forward with my work. Um, and I feel very blessed that I don't, um, I have, I, I can almost say I've almost never had a down time where I have 
um, I can't figure out what I want to make. You've never had that body of work that nobody wants to take. Oh, sure. That you hide yeah. in the back sure. of the studio. No, no I can, I can e easily overproduce one market. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But um, okay. that, um, that in and of itself doesn't preclude that I'm not going to make a piece that I'm interested in making or pursuing. And a long, long time ago, I was making um, stacking boxes. And um, I was so excited about making stacking boxes, and I produced a whole series of them. And I thought, uh, you know, they're going to save the world. You know, they'll be such um, hot sellers in the art market and stuff like that. And I put them out there in different galleries. I didn't sell a single stacking box for, I think, almost two years. And then all of a sudden, a buyer from Neiman Marcus showed up, and they bought five of them. Boom, 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 boom. And then all of a sudden, every museum in the country wanted a stacking box, it seemed. So, you know, three or four or five museums picked up stacking boxes. And all of a sudden, that form took off. And I don't, I don't know what the trigger was or why. And, you know, at some point, it's like, okay, I make other pieces other than these boxes. Would you like to look at something else? And they do, but... Um, um, I, I try to add to my making a vocabulary, repertoire, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, at least one new piece a year. And that doesn't sound like much, but I try to develop a new, you know, form and a way of thinking about that form and move it forward. And I like what Jan said uh, the other day in uh, one of the workshops. She said, uh, it came from Jim Lorio, but... Uh, you work on a form until you're tired of it, you know. When you don't have any interest in making that form anymore, then I, th I personally think you should stop. Because if you can't put your, you know, your experience, your own emotional, personal well-being into that, the making of that piece, whatever it is, maybe it's a drawing, maybe it's a stone sculpture, then my belief is that the person who's looking at it um, won't be able to receive it mm. on the other end. That, uh, that energy from the artist wouldn't be transferred through a piece without right. that passion. Yeah. That makes sense. And it, it, it might sound a little out there, but I really think that, you know, handmade piece painting, and we see it in museums. I mean, art has the ability to communicate ideas across generations. And long past my lifetime or your lifetime. I mean, I have a, a couple really beautiful pots that are 1,100 years old. And you can pick those pieces up and you can feel the spirit of the maker in those pieces. And yet they probably were just like the workers at Shamokas. They were just making pots. Um, with a career spanning um, some of the most dynamic decades in American ceramics, I'm sure you've experienced a breadth of creativity and expression in the ceramic discourses. Um, if you could project into the future, where do you think the collective world of ceramics is heading creatively? creatively. Well, big question. Yeah. Um, You're a fortune teller now. Fortune teller. Um, back up a few years. so. 1970, I remember it very well. I was um, 20 years old. Warren piled our whole class, which was Mark Ferris, Sandy Simon, Michael Simon, me, uh, Wayne Branham, um, a couple other people in the back of his green van, and we drove to Toronto for, I think it was in Nsika, it was some clay conference. And I think it was a hundred, the whole conference was 125 people. And Sika now is like 4,000 people, maybe, maybe 6,000 people before COVID. And at that conference, I remember being in a hotel room with uh, Peter Volkus, Ken Ferguson, David Shainer, um, Rudy Audio, um, Ron Myers, Warren, uh, a host of other heroes. We're all drinking beer. And we're all, students were all sitting on the floor, you know, just kind of starstruck. And that group of people, and I'm going to say maybe there were 
45 uh, remarkable ceramic artists in that generation, you know, the Mackenzie Volkus um, generation. Karen Carnes, you know, would be included in that. But those people changed the face of American ceramics through the 60s, 70s, and probably early 80s. And so I'm, you know, I'm in that third generation, and that ex explode, you know, that our generation of makers became larger, and that our children, you know, are the the next generation. I, I think it's healthy. I think the, you know, the biggest thing in ceramics is maybe the inbreeding, mm. that happens because of the advent of the internet and the the high levels of communication, you know, that we we have um, to today. So, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm I'm just blown away by the. Um, technical capabilities of young, young people. Well, resources Instagram. like Instagram and um, uh -huh. Pinterest is definitely you can share your work and get all of those visual resources uh -huh. uh, much more readily. So changes the game. And sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, an idea that's posted and it just sort of, you know, goes through the, the <laughs> ceramic population yeah. and. That's good and bad. Um, you know, the, the good part of it is uh, everybody kind of maybe grabs hold of it and puts their own interest into it or, you know, tries to copy it. Um, and, but again, back to uh, assimilation and understanding of an idea. Um, and again, I, I think sometimes like with the kilns that um, it's too easy, you know, they know how you can buy burners, you buy kilns that are digital, automatic. Um, and so people don't develop a deep understanding because they haven't had to uh, solve the problem. And you know, the problem's been solved, all they have to do is read about it and it works. But that's, that's my own perspective on that. And I, I think that um, there's a, a deeper uh, understanding and maybe um, uh, you know, love and, and yeah, curiosity that happens when you're uh, forced to solve, you know, something uh, totally on your own and come up with a solution. And definitely learning from those mistakes and the failed uh -huh. firings and right. reapproaching and uh, solving those problems, like uh -huh. you said. I could see the counterpoint being, though, if you remove that from the equation, you could focus on the construction of the work or the process more, uh -huh. but then, like you said, lose that uh, relationship with the firing process, mm -hmm. which is so important for ceramics. I think your point's really good that, you know, because you have this strong base that's been created of information, um, that's your starting point and you can move, you know, you're moving forward. And, and uh, as I said, you know, the uh, the remarkable thing is to watch the younger generation and their capacity to um, do these things with ceramics that you never would have thought possible at the time. You see it in sports too. I mean, you see people doing gymnastic tricks or you know um, ski tricks on slopes and uh, that you would have never thought physically possible in 30, 40 years ago. Well, we keep pushing the boundary forward and trying new things it makes the field more interesting uh -huh. dynamic um, well to close what advice could you give young ceramic artists coming up in the field well go back to uh, what I mentioned at the beginning Jake and that's um, you know I think it's very important for um, you know students especially to have uh, a strong basis in art history to study their you know, their art form, their craft, the history of it, um, have strong understanding of uh, material and process. And, um, you know, the, to be able to uh, begin to interject like personal vocabulary and experiential um, ideas into your work, I don't know exactly when that occurs. A lot of people will ask that question, you know, when is a piece going to become identifiable as mine. Um, 
I like to think I could see that within three, four weeks of the intro students. You could start that first critique. You could start to see individual touch, individual characteristics. And, you know, so, um, you know, work hard um, as uh, the, the great um, American sculptor David Smith said, you know, uh, ideas will come through work in the studio. So if you're not in the studio working, um, I had a friend of mine, uh, Kenji Akagawa, who taught uh, sculpture at MCAD for uh, 47 years. He used to have a saying, he'd say, all right, he says, get your butts in the studio. What are you waiting for, an angel to come down and kiss your butt? <laughs> and, um, but to, you know, to be active in the studio, pursue ideas, challenge yourself, um, trust in yourself. We, I think as artists all have the, the word insecurity tattooed on our waistline. And that's, that's a large part of that. Um, one of my favorite um, professors when I was an undergraduate was a, a woman by the name of Catherine Nash. And Katie Nash had welded ships and tanks during World War II with David Smith. And um, so I was preparing to apply for my BFA. And I came prepared with a whole list of, <coughs> excuse me like art history questions. And, um, you know, I was waiting for her to ask me her question. And she said, would you be willing to drive a truck? And I said, what? And she said, would you be willing to drive a, a, a truck to support your art? And I said, yes. And she said, you're in. And, you know, that it doesn't sound like much, but I think, um, you know, when you're giving advice to a young artist, and they're trying to figure out how to make a livelihood with their work or how to sell your work. Um, the advice is just don't give up. You know, do whatever you have to do, whether it's, it's waiting tables or teaching or um, doing, you know, carpentry work or whatever you have to do in your life to support your artwork, I think is the important thing. And don't give up. That's a great point to end on. Thank you. Brandon.